Well, first, I want to thank Zeta Fierro most warmly for arranging today's session and inviting me here. Uh, I know she had to overcome uh, one or two obstacles, including the fact that she had to chase uh, more than two biologists around the corner before she could find someone willing to face the dreaded Dr. Tobin in, in a crazy evolution debate. Now, she didn't have to chase me too uh, far because I've already debated the man back in April. And so I had some sense of what to expect. And he's a formidable opponent. He uses PowerPoint. He's got jokes. He's scavenged and collected a whole series of facts, pseudo facts, misinterpreted facts, etc., to create a certain impression. And he's impressive with doing it. But you know, I believe in learning from others, and I believe that I may have learned more from Dr. Hoban than he's learned from me. In any case, I'm eager for round two of our uh, match, or the rematch after the first match, and I'm delighted to be invited, and I thank you and your family uh, for arranging this event. I hope you, well, I'll skip that. Let me just say at the outset that we operate a little bit differently. I'm a scientist, and under no circumstances is the theory of evolution under attack within science. Dr. Hoban may seek to create a different impression on this, but evolutionary theory, evolutionary biology, evolutionary genetics, and now this is going on. Not good. The others, what's working, I'm sorry, uh, have been well established. They're a growing discipline, which uh, serve the test of science, which is if we can successfully predict new phenomena and interpret existing phenomena successfully. Dr. Hoban is, by his own admission, an evangelist, and he goes about trying to pull Hello. He goes about, quote, trying to strengthen the faith of the believer, confound, confound and convict the evolutionist, and win the law to Christ. I'm not trying to do any of it. In particular, I'm trying as a scientist to figure out what's true. And I cannot concern myself with whether what I find out to be true or believe to be true shapes your faith or strengthens your faith. And I think you don't want your scientists taking science based on trying to prop up people's faith. If science took that approach, the sun would still be circling uh, the earth. And various other discoveries would be muted or never made because of the possibility that it would shape someone's faith. If your faith is weakened by knowledge of how the universe actually works, it's a problem for you to deal with. If you wish to come to me and ask how I've dealt with the same problem, I'm only too happy to share my thoughts. But I cannot take that viewpoint at the outset. I'm not trying to confound or convict uh, anybody. Or convict anybody. As for winning the laws of Christ, let's discuss what that means exactly a little bit later on. Let me just emphasize at the outset what this is not. This is not a debate between godless atheism and religion. It is not a debate between Christianity and evolution. The reason why it is is because evolution is as fully consistent with God existing as it is with God not existing. In fact, it's probably, in my opinion, more fully consistent with God existing. But I, as a scientist, could never prove that point and won't pretend that I could. Um, more specifically, there is no contradiction between Christianity and evolution unless you take a particular I believe very narrow, distorted image of Christianity. That every word of the book that I hold in my hand, the Bible, means exactly what I tell you it does. Which in my view directly contradicts the teachings of Jesus. So the kind of Christianity that is pervaded as uh, being anti-evolutionary and so on, to me, is inconsistent with the teachings of Jesus. Now, can you be an evolutionist and a Christian? Of course you can. Many have been, many are. I'll give you one more example. Myself. 
until computer first me that I was studying one book seriously, and that was the Bible. I mean, it's true in my mother. Now, at age 13, I discovered astronomy and the vastness and the beauty and the majesty of this universe were overwhelming and overpowering. Did that challenge my faith? Did I fall back and say, Jesus, you're, you're losing your grip on me? Of course not. Quite the contrary. It made God, uh, majesty, if you believe in God, only the greater. And furthermore, uh, although it shrunk human beings, uh, was that how anti-Christian? Of course not. Jesus emphasized humility, not arrogance and pride, and the absence of self-centeredness. Stop this. Israelites always talking about themselves and not seeing other people, etc. Uh, got a couple of general uh, set of principles that work for everything. Now, later when I learned biology, there was a similarly vast story about the life here on Earth. Four billion years, etc. So, I was not so much attracted by the beauty and grandeur of that story, although it has all of that, but by the fact that it provided a logic, evolution through natural selection, that you could use to interpret the meaning of biological character, the meaning of living characteristics. Now, there are two kinds of creationists uh, that exist these days. There are the intelligent designers and the recent creationists. The intelligent designers accept physics, they accept chemistry, they accept astrophysics, they accept astronomy, they accept geology, they accept paleontology, they accept organic evolution. They just say that God has been behind the whole thing, that the whole universe and life is intelligently designed. I have no quarrel with that viewpoint. It doesn't brush up against my science exactly because it would be very hard to define the work that would show you where the intelligent design was different from non-intelligent design or whatnot. But it is fully consistent with everything we know about the, the Earth and the universe. Now, the recent creationist of which Dr. Hoban is a well-known uh, example, they take a much different position. They dismiss all those disciplines I have mentioned uh, and, um, have, and, and, and want to base their uh, view of the earth, theology, of astronomy, etc., on a few lines in Genesis. And in particular, they want to explain the entire paleontological record, and I'll come back to it in a moment, uh, by the flood by Noah's flood. Now this, from my standpoint, is an extraordinary fantasy uh, that Noah's uh, flood and ark are a plausible account of the fossil record and life we know it today is beyond credulity. And I will then come to that evidence. But I will just stress at the outset that to me there are two very different views of the universe here um, that are, are being described and of the God behind the universe, except that God is there. On the one hand, I believe in a consistent, rational, sensible world without dreadful, inexplicable calamities that destroy 99.9% of the species all because human beings weren't behaving themselves properly. Uh, by contrast, Dr. Copeland believes in an arbitrary, bizarre, capricious world uh, according to a private interpretation of a privately held book in which God created the whole universe and obliterated whole sections of it in a mass uh, 300 days because of uh, uh, disputes with the behavior of human beings and so on. All right, now let's get to the other. The fossil record. If there were no fossil record at all, and yet evolution were still true. For example, if living creatures, when they died, they pulverized, and so they could not be there. Then it would still be difficult to prove evolution, although there would be many other proofs. Uh, but still you would say, where is something kind of that I can look at? One of the most striking things is that life has left this imprint from earlier creatures, and this has been known and studied in depth for over 200 years now. And the vastness of the fossil record, for those of you who don't waste your time on this stuff, um, uh, may be surprising. There are over 80 billion, 80 billion 
fossils that have been discovered, and hundreds of millions that have been described, cataloged, placed in uh, museum collections, assorted, organized by strata, organized by time, etc. This is not five or six fossils. This is not 12 fossils in the horse store or whatever. This is a massive record of past life, of creatures that are not here alive today, but were clearly alive at some point in the past. Now, how does Dr. Hoven deal with this? Well, according to him, we were all alive uh, before the flood, but then along came the flood and wiped out all the ones that are found in the fossil record. Now, that creates in the, in the flood, that creates a whole series of problems. For example, what's the size distribution of creatures as you go down geological strata? According to him, that's just all mud from the big flood, and they got killed, and they died, and uh, they got classified as different layers. We know that the denser you are, and also separately, the heavier you are, the more you will tend to sink to the bottom. That's not the way the fossils are organized. The largest mammals are very recent, near the top layer. Uh, the heavy uh, creatures, elephants, and their relatives, etc., etc. Smaller mammals are lower down, even though we know the smaller mammals are less dense and way less. It should not be in that order. So the size distribution is all. Secondly, data. There are a whole series of methods, and this comes out of physics, chemistry, and so on, for dating rocks. Carbon 14 is one example. It works up to about 50,000 years ago. Argon, potassium, if you want to go back a billion years. Now, Dr. Hogan is fond of pointing out inconsistencies in estimates. What he's done, done is gone and climbed around and found 20 estimates for carbon dating there in contradiction. One says 3,000, one says 30,000, even though one is the of the animal, the other is the bone of the same animal, what? Neglects to point out is that there are 50,000, 70,000 measurements of carbon dating. A whole world of consistent dating, which is in turn consistent with strata, older strata, date to further in the past, etc. Now, scientists have a rule. If you have 50,000 observations in one direction and five in the other, you don't even pay attention to five. If you have 50 or 100, you hardly pay attention to it. If you've got 50,000 in one direction and 5,000 in another, you've got a problem. You need to take it seriously and try to um, uh, deal with the contradiction. So this is a fantasy on this part. There's no consistent series of dating that comes out of other disciplines in biology. There are minute details of the fossil record. There are just absurd to imagine the results of for example, by our day, scientists say 70 million years ago, around the world, had strata that had the same kinds of creatures 70 million years ago, and dates 70 million years ago, you find a very thin layer of a chemical called iridium. And that's really just. And what it is now believed is just a hypothesis. The kind of evidence is going to support this, that came when a large meteor hit the Earth. Spewed up this iridium, which covered the earth with it, it blotted out the sun for days and days and days. It was probably instrumental in bringing the dinosaurs to the end. How on earth, in this incredible flood, with all of this water heating up and down, by these little dust particles, kept at the same level all the way around the world, at the level that corresponds to 70 million years ago by scientific calculations? I didn't know some of these things before I had to debate them the first time. I don't know why I like studying the arguments of nature of evolution. I'm all working in a particular area of evolution and genetics now, and I've got to do my work. Uh, if you're going to get the water by raining 40 days and nights, it has to rain about 11 feet an hour. Remember, a minute an hour is a heavy downpour. Uh, uh, 11 feet an hour would splat you to the ground as if it Furthermore, I didn't know this before you made it the last time, it generates heat. Uh, the release of water in the atmosphere generates heat. That amount of water would result in water that came down uh, at about 3,000 degrees temperature. So you've got a boiling mass of water. It's killing everything in the water. Not just the fossils, 
or any other fish except for the How do you always survive that? I don't know. Well, last time he died, he died by saying, well, you'll find one little half a line, and that's actually from this in Genesis, where it talks about water gushing out from every corner. So now he wants the water not just to come down from above, but to come from down below. But we know that any water that does come up from below is superheated and comes up boiling already. The molten uh, core of this planet is only about five kilometers below uh, sea level. And the, the Earth gets very warm very quickly. Now, where did all that water come from? Where did it all vanish to? You can't have that amount of water. Water is so massive that it, that it comes to the top of Mount Everest. Water that's five miles high and then suddenly disappears in the space of less than a year, according to Jess, where did it go to? Back up in the atmosphere, down to the rocks, and had to go somewhere. We got no evidence of it. Now, thirdly, the massive murder of the flood. Um, well, skip, skip the murder of all the species that are no longer with us. You had millions of species that had to be without food for about a year. Uh, it's a fantasy to believe that uh, Noah and his brethren were collecting all the food for all the species. The seawater would have been diluted so that you wouldn't have had seawater with all this rainwater coming down. A whole bunch of fish cannot survive unless it's really seawater, etc. Number four, let me give you another absurdity. 80% of our parasites, roughly, that is our diseases, the virus, bacteria, from the zoa, were, live inside us. Now, another 20% can also be found in a vector, like malaria can be in us or it can be in a mosquito. Now that means, this is true for all other creatures, that when he got together, they all got together two lions, two leopards, two gazelles, two kangaroos, two bears. Each of them had to be sick unto death. One of them had to have 40% at least of the species disease, and the other had to have another 40%. And somehow there they are, ill fed, ill cared for, having to walk back to Australia with their kangaroo. Meanwhile, they've got half the parasites almost in their species. Nothing like we've ever seen uh, since. Um, and what about the incredible arrival and departure that's, that's uh, suggested by this? Remember when Noah's blood was invented as a story, people didn't know the world was round. They knew of the world uh, a few tens of miles away from where they lived. They didn't know that kangaroos we know are found the fossil record in Australia. You would have had to walk from Australia and walk back. Polar bears would have had to come down from the cold where they can live to the hot climate of the Middle East and somehow to find no one climbing for and so on. Then at the end of this uh, monstrous event with a cauldron of 3,000 degrees of water in which the ship is somehow maintaining itself, they got to wait for the water all this and put it in little uh, rat hole. Uh, that these people are imagining, and they've got to walk back from all this blood and heartache over dead, stinking pieces and so on. This is your view of how God changed the universe, and how he developed it off of a little story in Genesis. And finally, before I turn to that story, Genesis, what about genetics? And I deliberately asked him, uh, Dr. Hogan about it last time, and I will ask him about it very early on in my questions because I know he hasn't been exposed to this before, so let's see how fast he learned from me. Remember, Noah, Noah and his children and their wives, that's what we have on the human side, all the other creatures were marched in two by two. Well, what does that mean? That means they go back and breathe. Then their children breathe with each other because there ain't no other line. Right? Then their grandchildren breed with each other, because there ain't no other line. And every generation thereafter. And it's a trivial calculation to show, and we have evidence, uh, I don't know how many bodies do have to show that this is true, that inbreeding obliterates genetic diversity within individuals. So every human being in this room, approximately, if you go down to the genotype and compare the genes you got from your mother, the genes you got from your father, that 10% of the loop side, they'll be different. We are outbred species that benefit from outbreeding, we benefit from genetic diversity within ourselves. The world doesn't.
to that. That gets obliterated by inbreeding. You know the ill effects of post inbreeding. You certainly heard about it. You certainly know that that's the reason why we tend to avoid it. But if you keep it up, and it just takes a few generations, you can, in 12, 15 generations with that degree of inbreeding, you can take that to 1 100th this level. So instead of 10% of the low stack being heterozygous, one tenth of 1%. Yet if you look at all these features, uh, a mere uh, 4,000 years later or whatever, a mere 300 generations later, somehow they've all reconstituted the genetic variability that they lost in this history. Beyond credulity. Now, look, thank you. I'll be done in five minutes. Um, now, there was a real flow uh, back in that area of the world out of which the Bible came, and which many people believe is the reason for the flood story that you find in Genesis. One reason for this is that the same story is found in related people, different religions, different religious traditions, but they have a flood story. Occasionally you find a flood story elsewhere, but usually you do not. Every people, whether you go to this school in, in uh, southern Africa, whether you go to China, Malaysia, wherever you go, Eskimos people have what's called an origin story, an origin myth. Uh, but it's only there that they have this flood. Well, what was the real flood? Dated by carbon 14 and repeatedly redated. It was about 8,600 years ago, the flooding of the Black Sea, uh, when the Mediterranean topped a natural uh, land barrier and started spilling over into an area that was under sea water but had uh, some freshwater uh, small lake and a lot of human habitation. But you know, when the sea uh, re uh, reaches something like that, that digs through and digs through uh, and finally comes over at great speed. Um, and recent, they recently sent dirigibles down there. And I'm sure enough, there are whole villages buried down there, uh, uh, visible with the help of submersibles. Um, the Bosphorus Channel is what we believe was the channel that led to this uh, flood. The depth of the water now is roughly a half a kilometer. There is evidence that, that fleeing people from that area uh, may have colonized sections of Europe because suddenly we see at that time a new way of doing agricultural technology which developed in that area. Now I have other points that I would like to make and that I hope will come out both in questions and that I pose to Dr. Golden and he's back to me and your own questions. But all I'm saying to you now is um, this is an argument between two very different approaches to religion and two somewhat different uses of science. He is an attacker of science, an opponent of science. I'm a scientist. He is not a scientist. He does not do scientific work. He does not predict events and so forth in science. He does his work explicitly to try to cast doubt on to bring people back to what is to me a very simple-minded and not very mature approach to religion. Thank you. Shape. They were all finches, the same species of bird. He studied the birds carefully by measuring their beak shape. 
and size, and decided probably all these princes had a common ancestor. I would agree, Charlie. It was a bird. And based on the variations of beak shape, but this study was tested again, by the way, by the grants back for 10 year study. This is from 9 to 10 millimeters. You know how much a millimeter is? They measured the beak shape difference between wet years and dry years, and after studying for 10 years, they noticed the beak shape varies on wet years and dry years within a few tenths of a millimeter. I agree, variations happen, but there's still a bird. Okay. Then Darwin wrote his book in 1859 called The Origin of Species. Now, the Bible doesn't talk about species, it talks about kinds, and it says if they're able to bring forth, they're the same kind. You know, a dog and a wolf can bring forth, they can mate and bring forth, a dog and a pine tree cannot. Okay? They're a different kind. Uh, Charlie observed what is sometimes called microevolution. I object to the term, and I don't think we should use it, but they do, so I'll explain it. Microevolution tells us animals and plants can produce a variety within their kind. Variations can happen. It is observable, it is scientific, it is scriptural, it's also a fact. I happen to believe microevolution, if you want to call it that, works. It's fine. The question is, does it go any farther than that? For instance, we have big dogs and little dogs. These are probably the current extremes available in the dog family, but there's still a dog. And every five year old kid knows there's still a dog. I've had five year old kids do this all over the world. I've given this picture. I'll say, here's a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others? <laughs> They get it every single time, okay? It's a dog. National Geographic ran an article about how the dog evolved from a wolf. I agree. If you want to use the word evolved, it's a variety of a wolf. See, the Bible says they bring forth after their kind, and that's all we've ever observed. We're going to talk tonight about evolution, Dr. Trimmer's at his request, about after uh, life gets started, not about the first part of the evolution theory, which would have to be true. So I'm just going to put this in historical perspective for you. In order for evolution for, to be true, first we'd have to have cosmic evolution, the origin of time, space, matter. We'd have to have an answer for that one. Then we'd have to have the chemicals evolve. There are 92 known elements that naturally occur, and plus the other synthetic ones. They would have to somehow evolve from nothing, from this Big Bang, hydrogen, whatever it's loaded. Then we'd have to have stars evolve. Nobody's ever seen stars form. They imagine a few are forming where spots are getting brighter, but they've never proven a star is forming. It could be, of course, the dust is clearing and a star showing from behind it. The fact of the matter is that the current estimate is there are enough stars out there that we know about that everybody on Earth can own 11 trillion of them to yourself. And we've never seen the formation of one of them. We see a blow up all the time. That's the opposite, okay? Fourthly, organic evolution, the origin of life. All these are major obstacles, but I'm going to give Dr. Trivers all of these. At his request, we're going to discuss tonight, did evolution happen once life got started? Okay. I don't think any of these four are possible. I think all of them are ir uh, insurmountable hurdles for the evolution theory. However, we're going to give them all of them. Next, we have to have what's called macroevolution. And this is where the argument really centers tonight. Is it possible for an animal to, to produce a different kind of animal? And is there any evidence that they ever have? Then we have lastly what's called microevolution. I agree with this one. I don't like the word, but I agree it happens. Variations happen. I'm convinced the first five are purely religious. They are imagination. You have to imagine that happen. They never are observable. They are outside the realm of science. It's part of somebody's religion. I think it's a dumb religion. But hey, this is America, the home of the fee and the land of the slave, or whatever. And you can have all the religion you want, okay? But I present paying for his religion to be taught in our schools at my expense, okay? Their evolution should start a private school and teach evolution to those that want to pay and come learn it, like any other religion has to do and push their, push their faith. This textbook changes the meaning of the word. It says evolution is change over time. And you have to define this word, because this word is slippery, okay? I agree, things change over time, but watch how they change it in the book. In other words, living things have changed over time. They're just going to automatically skip the first four vital stages of evolution, which would have to happen. And I'm going to skip that tonight, too. Just, I'm pointing it out. These are insurmountable, insurmountable obstacles. Then they say, Evolution can be defined as a change in species over time. Well, now, I agree, that happens. I think species can change, but I think the species have limits. One of the lies in the textbooks is this one. That's not really what they mean by evolution. Variations certainly happen, but they have limits. Farmers have been trying for years to get bigger pigs, but they will never get a pig as big as Texas. There is a limit someplace, okay? Roaches in Florida, where I'm from, get resistant to pesticides after a while, but they will never get resistant to a sledgehammer. <laughs> the point is, there are limits, and we can spend all day on that one. Uh, they still produce the same kind, and I'll stick with the Bible word kind, okay? Not species. The information for the variation was already present. 
You can crossbreed dogs and get a great name or a chihuahua, only because the gene code is already in the dog gene code someplace. You don't get new information added. Real evolution would be an increase in genetic complexity. By the time you get to a chihuahua, you are swimming in the shallow end of the gene pool. They have lost a lot of information. And chihuahuas would not last in the real world, by the way. Go ahead, make my day. Just thinking. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Real evolution would require an increase in genetic complexity. I would like Dr. Travers to give us an example of one increase in genetic complexity that's ever been observed. This question was asked to Richard Dawkins. I saw it on videotape. They asked him the question, can you give an example of evolution where there's been an increase in genetic complexity? He was dead quiet for 19 seconds and finally said, shut the camera off, please. He can't think of one. I can tell you why. There aren't any. Okay? There are variations of corn, but they're still corn, okay? You're never going to get away a large tomato or hamster to grow on your corn stalk, okay? There's a variety of wolves, and they had a, probably a, common, a variety of dogs, and probably had a common ancestor. This Irish textbook calls it divergent evolution. Oh, come on, it's still a dog. Don't give it a fancy name, it's a dog. It's not divergent evolution, it's a variety of dog. This Mexican textbook says this is evolution from a common ancestor, the horse and the zebra. Nobody argues with that. It's a variety of horse. And there are a lot of varieties of horses available today. Those tiny ones and great big ones. You can crossbreed horses, zebras, you can get uh, zorses, zombies, yonis, z dogs, and zebras, depending on how you cross them. I agree, but you can't cross a horse and a banana or a pine tree or, or an elephant, okay? Um, Kentucky Derby has proven in the last hundred years they've gone from an average winning speed of 127 to an average winning speed of 123. They've proven there's probably a limit to horse speed. And there's been a lot of money spent on Kentucky Derby trying to get faster horses. I mean, if anything would have shown us evolution, this would have been it. And nothing has changed other than just a little tiny bit faster. They probably have come close to reaching the limit of horse speed. There's a variety of cows, I agree, a variety of chickens. This magazine offers chickens for sale. You want to get cinnamon queens, red rocks, white rocks, cherry acres? But then it says on the next page, jumbo fowl are the original bird from which all varieties and strains of domesticated chickens are derived. Did you know all the chickens had a common ancestor? It was a chicken. There are eight kinds of bears in the world. They might have had a common ancestor. I don't know. But there could be a bear for one. Broccoli, cauliflower, and you know, Brussels sprouts had a common ancestor, but it was a plant. This is not really evolution. Here's an English walnut tree graft on top of a black walnut stump. They do this all over California because of the English walnut nuts are better and black walnut roots are better. But you can never graft an English walnut tree on the back of a turtle. My whole point is, there are limits, okay? They're both walnut trees. They're exactly what the Bible says. They bring forth after their kind has proven true in 6,000 years of observed human history. Now, if you want to believe, or any of you want to believe that there's been something other than this happened, you're welcome to believe that, but you just left science and went to fairy tale and don't even realize the problem. Evolution is a fairy tale for grown-ups. It's not a science. Uh, let's see. Um, one more thing here. I collect textbooks. I happen to love the field of science. I've taught it for years, and I, I study it avidly, okay? There's no evidence to support evolution except things that have been proven wrong a long time ago. If some real evidence exists, I want you to show me. Now, last time I debated Dr. Trippers, and again tonight, he mentions several branches of science. You know, astronomy, biology, he throws out these words. He says, I don't believe in them. I do believe in them, okay? I do believe in real science. And I don't want you to just throw out a gen generic term and say, well, biology proves evolution. I want you to give a specific example, a real specific example of what proves evolution. If I had a theory, and I said, I think the moon is made of green cheese. Anybody can have any theory they want, okay? But then, suppose I said, NASA proved it when they went there in 1973 on a secret mission. Now I'm using lies to support my theory. It's okay to have a theory, but it's not okay to lie to support the theory. It'd be even worse for me to force everybody else to pay tax dollars to support me while I lie. I am convinced that the stuff that's used in, in the textbooks to support the evolution theory has all been proven wrong. It's a lie. I'm open for evidence. I'm open for discussion. I want to see some evidence for evolution. They say we've got evidence from fossils. Dr. Trevor's mentioned that tonight. This is silly. Absolutely no fossil could possibly count as evolution. Think about it. Imagine you're in a court of law. You bring in your bones, how you found in the dirt. You say, Your Honor, these bones are the ancestors of somebody today. They would laugh at you. You can't prove those bones had any kids. You sure can't prove they had different kids. Why on earth would you think a bone in the dirt can do something animals today can't do? Dogs produce dogs, cats produce cats. No fossils count as evidence for evolution. 
And this is the biggest evidence they've got. And they'll bring it up ten more times tonight, I'm sure. The fossils prove evolution. I'm telling you, just from a purely logical perspective, no fossils could possibly count. Think about it. In a court of law, they wouldn't hold up two seconds. Okay? Evolution's dead. Some followers have a hard time letting it go. They lie and make things, everybody's fine. Oh, you never look better. Oh, pulse and heart rate feel good. Now, I'm not saying Dr. Trevor specifically lies. I don't know if he does or doesn't. But I know the evidence to support evolution in the textbooks is lies. And if he teaches that evidence after he knows it's been proven wrong, then he's a liar. I've never called him a liar, and I wouldn't unless he lied. Okay, I don't know that he has. But if he uses some of these lies to support his theory, then, then it's, it's, it's incorrect, and he should do that at his expense, not everybody else's expense. Okay, textbooks will say natural selection uh, are mutations as part of the process of evolution. I disagree. It doesn't, mutations don't produce anything new. All they do is scramble information that's already existing. It's not an increase in genetic complexity, that's for sure. We have all kinds of examples of mutants, but they're not increasing genetic complexity. For instance, this textbook shows a fly, and it says normal fruit flies have two wings. This mutant has four. This rare mutation, like most mutations, is harmful. Beneficial mutations are the raw material for natural selection. Uh, excuse me. Why don't they give an example? Why don't they show a picture of a beneficial mutation? I would like you tonight, Dr. Trivers, to name at least two or three proven beneficial mutations that increase genetic complexity. Because you would have to have trillions of those to get your theory to work, to go from a rock to a human over 4.6 billion years. Now, the one that they always give is sickle cell anemia. Here we go. This professor said, sickle cell anemia proves evolution. Because people who get uh, in Africa who get sickle cell anemia cannot get malaria, or at least are less likely to get malaria. I said, well, that's brilliant, sir. That's like saying if you cut off your legs, you can't get athlete's foot. You know, that's not an increase in genetic complexity. It's a loss of information. In both cases, it's a loss of information. It's not a gain of information. We're talking about natural selection. Natural selection selects. It doesn't create a thing. And they keep using this natural selection as evidence for evolution. Natural selection is a selective process. It's not going to create anything. We go through this for days on videotape number four. Selecting doesn't create a thing. Okay. The pepper moth is used in the textbooks as evidence for evolution. They tell the kids, they counted the moths on the trees and found it was 95% white moths and 5% black. And then when they burned coal in the factories, the trees turned black, so they counted the moths again. And now it was 5% white and 95% black. The truth of the matter is the whole story is a phony. It didn't happen. After 40 years of watching, they found a total of two moths on the trees. Two. So they glued dead moths to a tree trunk to take that picture for your kid's textbook. This is a lie. Been proven wrong years ago. It ought to be taken out of the textbooks. Even if it were true, it's still a moth, and it's still the same two colors of moth. It's a variation of the population percentage. It's not evolution. That's not evidence for evolution. But they still keep this in the textbooks because they don't have anything else. Okay, let's see. Uh, all the evidence that they give, I am convinced, has been proven wrong a long time ago. Let's see. Let get, uh, a couple of things here. They tell, the, they tell the kids that fruit flies evidence for evolution. They put the flies in the laboratory and nuke them and microwave them and x-ray them and do all kinds of mean things to make those flies have mutated babies. They got flies with curled wings. They fly around. Couldn't go anywhere. They got flies with no wings. What do you call that? Crawl? You can't fly. Okay. <laughs> After raising all these mutated flies, they concluded there were absolutely no improvements. The natural limits to biological change, uh, Dr. Lester said, fruit flies refuse to become anything but fruit flies under any circumstances yet devised. Well, duh. It's true, fruit flies produce a variety of babies, but every variation they got was worse off. And this guy publishes an article in U.S. News and World Report and says, Flies in the north have wings 4% larger than flies in the south, and that is proof of Darwin's theory. You've got to be kidding. They tell the kids to think critically. Oh, we can spend an hour on that one. They don't think critically. They don't think at all. Okay. Uh, they say evidence for evolution comes from homologous structures, from the four limbs of birds, dolphins, and humans, from vestigial structures, and from molecules, proteins. Well, now, just we could take all those against them all night, but... The evidence for homology is right here in the textbook. It says the human has two bones in the wrist, called the radius and the ulna. There you are, boys and girls. And the penguin has two bones in his liver, called the radius and ulna. Yep, that proves we've got a common ancestor. That's the message they get across in the textbooks. These homology
Archaeological structures provide evidence that these animals evolved from a common ancestor. Talks about the crocodile, that same thing. Okay, it goes over and over. Seal sliver. Here it is. Comparative anatomy provides further evidence of evolution. Commonality suggests that these and other vertebrate animals are all related. They probably evolved from a common ancestor. Now, if somebody wants to believe that, honestly, I don't care what they believe. That's perfectly fine. But that's not science. It probably proves they have a common designer. Similarities might prove the same designer made them. Hello? It's not proof of a common ancestor. Students are never shown there are other options. They're being brainwashed, not educated. This is all over the world. There's textbooks from Latvia, one from Ireland. It's all over the world. The same stuff. In Russia, I've been to 30 countries. They use the same stuff over and over and over. Similar design might prove the same designer made them. Let's see. Uh, I'm run out of time. They say we've got evidence from development. This is still used in textbooks all over the world, proven wrong in 1874. Here, this guy said the similarity between early stages and development helped convince Darwin that all forms of life shared common ancestors. Darwin considered this by far the strongest class of facts in favor of his theory. What they're talking about here is the embryonic development of different creatures. This Irish textbook says the presence of fish like structures and embryos of different species shows these animals have evolved from fish and share the basic pattern of fish development. Are they saying the human goes through the fish stage? Yes, they are. The evolutionary idea that Sigmund Freud relied on most heavily in the manuscript is the maximum that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, which is the embryo goes through the gill slit process. Here. That is, the development of the individual recapitulates the evolution of the entire species. This is baloney. It's been proven wrong 128 years ago. The embryo has these folds of skin right there, and this textbook says they have gills like a fish. It's a line. Those are not gill slits. Those little folds of skin later develop into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. They never have anything to do with breathing. I've seen people with five or six chins, and they can't breathe through any of them but the top one. Those are not gill slits. Hegel made up this entire stupid idea right after he read Darwin's book. Darwin's book was translated to German in 1860. Hegel read it and said, what a great theory. If only we had some evidence. Now, Hegel happened to be an embryology professor at the University of Vienna in Germany. He had access to photographs and drawings of all kinds of animals in their embryonic development stage. So he took a drawing of a dog and a human and he changed them and made them look exactly the like. He lied and admitted later that he lied. He made huge posters of his fake drawings to travel all over Germany to prove evolution was the past. Now, on top of Hegel's drawings, underneath are photographs. Actual photographs by Dr. Richardson in, um, what's the school in England? Uh, one of the Oxford, there's about 20 colleges in Cambridge, which is there a few weeks ago. Anyway, I'll get it there. I got it. Uh, Hegel, at the University of Jena, his own university tried him for lying. They tried one of their professors. He said, I should feel utterly condemned were it not that hundreds of the best observers and biologists lie on the same charge. <laughs> it's okay for me to lie, because everybody else lies. This biogenetic law cannot be weeded out in spite of having demonstrated to be wrong by numerous subsequent scholars. The biogenetic law is as dead as a doornail, American Scientist magazine. Here it is, uh, St. George Hospital Medical School in London. Uh, this is the guy who did the picture, the picture of Richardson. He said, Hegel confessed the drawing from memory and was convicted of fraud, but the drawings persist. Why did he keep this in the books? His ex Hegel's exact chart was used in the textbook used in Pennsylvania University, West Florida, and Pensacola just last year. They're still teaching this, and it's in textbooks all over the world. Is it in the biology book you guys have here? Do you have that with the internet? It's in the 10th grade biology book. They're still teaching the embryo as gill slits. Hello, folks. I know it takes a while to get textbooks up today. 125 years is long enough, okay? Turn that page out of the book, okay? Ken Miller is still using it. He teaches at Brown University in Rhode Island. I debated Ken Miller once on the radio. We won't do it again. We tried everything we can to get him to debate it again. And I appreciate you doing this again. But uh, Ken Miller is um, using this as evidence. Uh, 1998 textbook used in Pensacola, Florida, using the embryonic gill slits. Presence of gills and tails, the gill slits on a mammal, this is simply not true. Here's a 2000 textbook, 2001 junior high textbook. The similarities provide evidence that these three animals evolved from a common ancestor. Vertebrate embryos and similar characteristics, it's used all over the place. Gills of a fish. Humans and fish embryos resemble each other because humans and fish share a common ancestor. Five minutes, okay. Used in college textbooks. Evolutionary history of organisms is also seen in the development of embryos. Here we go again. Now, look, if you have evidence for evolution, show me. 
But don't use this. This is a lie, okay? No, this is not true. So if you got some evidence, I would like to see it. Oh, man, I took my five minutes and I went to the wrong, I don't have my hyperlink page here. Just give me a second. According to evolution, things get better automatically, you know? Okay, here we go. Textbooks are going to tell your kids that the appendix is vestigial. This is a lie. Your appendix is part of your immune system. It's been known for years. You need your appendix. Now you can live without your appendix. You can live without your adenoids. You can live without your tonsils. You can live without both your arms and both your legs. It doesn't prove you don't need it. The appendix is where the immune systems are initiated for the lower colon. Uh, Broder Encyclopedia tells about that. If you take your appendix out, you've got a much better chance of getting quite a few diseases. But hey, sometimes that's the best option. Get rid of it if it blew up, okay? This textbook says the whale has a vestigial pelvis. Many organisms retain traces of their evolutionary history. For example, the whale retains pelvic and leg bones as useless vestiges. This is a lie, proven wrong years ago. They say, uh, just imagine whales walking around. There's the bones you're talking about right there. Just imagine the whale walking around. <laughs> there they are, Cambridge University. There they are. There they are, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The whale pelvis. Yep. Just imagine them walking around. I tried, you know, I just can't. Um, the whale pelvis is located far from the vertebrae and has no apparent function. The whale's pelvis uh, is evidence of its evolution from four legged land dwelling mammals. This is simply a lie. Those bones are necessary for their anchor points to certain muscles attached to that allow the whales to reproduce. It has to do with getting baby whales. It has nothing to do with walking on land. So either these guys are all ignorant about whale anatomy and they should not be writing a book about it, or they're deliberately lying, trying to find evidence for their theories, but your kids. Now, honestly, if there's evidence for evolution, show me. But don't use this as a lie. Such structures, which are considered to be evidence of an organism's evolutionary past, are called vestigial. For example, hind legs of whale are vestigial structures. There are no vestigial structures, and if there were, that would still be the opposite of evolution. That's not evidence. They talk about amblocetus. You know what they really found for amblocetus is the dark bones here. We could talk a long time. She brings that up here in Q&A. I'm ready for that one. I'd love to see that one. Ambl or pacocetus. There's another one. All they found was a few bones of the head. Later on, they found more bones of a different animal. They said, wow, it's like a wolf. The first one, though, they found a piece of skull, a small piece of jaw, and a few teeth. But the ear bones resemble slightly whale ear bones. Thought, That's all they needed. Proof. There's a missing link right there. An ear bone. We've got in our museum a 15 and a half foot python snake. At the south end, he's got little tiny claws sticking out of the body right there. These little claws are attached to a little tiny bone that goes up inside the snake's body. We also have a boa in our museum, six and a half foot live one. You can come down and pet it if you like. But they say, this textbook says, the rudimentary hind legs of a python snake are seen in the skeletal structure. Rudimentary hind legs. Those little claws are used in mating, okay? The snake doesn't have any arms, and he can't talk and say, so little runny. This has nothing whatsoever to do with walking on land. Now, if you got evidence for evolution, then show me. But don't use this kind of stuff, okay? They're lying to your kids. This guy says, the humans have a tailbone that is of no apparent use. I debated an atheist one time, and he said, I got proof for evolution. Give a tailbone. I said, sir, I taught biology and anatomy. I happen to know there are nine little muscles that attach to the tailbone, without which you cannot perform some valuable functions. I won't tell you what they all are, but trust me, you need those muscles. I said, now, if you think the tailbone is vestigial, I will pay to have yours removed. <laughs> Says that's your tailbone is a small bone at the end of the human vertebral column. It has no present function, and it's thought to be the remainder of bones that once occupied the long tail of a tree living ancestor. This is simply a lie. Okay? Now, tonight, I would like Dr. Trivers to be very specific. I don't want him to say biology offers evidence for evolution. I don't want to hear that. I want to see specifically what part of biology offers evidence for evolution. Don't say geology offers evidence for evolution. Give me a specific, okay? If you want to talk about the fossil record, I'm thoroughly prepared to do that. There is no fossil record. There are fossils, but there is no fossil record. They don't come with the data when you dig them off the ground. All we know is there's a lot of bones found in the dirt. I mean, billions of them. None of them indicate they have changed from one to another. If you found one that looked a little different than something alive today, that still could prove an extinct species. You found a missing link. I'm telling you, in a court of law, they laugh at you bring up fossils. But the evolution doesn't have to be proven in a court of law. It only has to be made believable to a bunch of students. By a professor who has a very obvious academic and psychological advantage over those students. And I, for one, resent
and paying for that. And I think some other folks did too. Thank you so much. Now, 
He wants to name me a beneficial mutation. I can name you hundreds, depending on the species or the context. In the case of bacteria, many mutations have appeared and spread in the face of antibiotics. They were not caused, as I've read Dr. Hogan assert somewhere, I believe, uh, by the antibiotics. They were selected when the antibiotics appear. And as most of you must know now, the evolution of resistance to antibiotics is a major and growing problem in medicine. We now often have to hit the same disease that could have been killed with one antibiotic. We have to hit the individual with three different antibiotics, cut it in three different directions to kill the organ. Why? Because beneficial mutations have occurred from the standpoint of the bacteria, which conferred greater survival and reproduction in the face of the antibiotics. Bacteria are not trying, so to speak, to benefit ourselves. Um, endless examples. A recurrent mutation in Australian bloatflies, for example, it was kept at low numbers and been studied for a number of years. Australia has excellent genetics. And then suddenly along came a pesticide used uh, against uh, other creatures, which happened to hit the bloatfly, and lo and behold, this mutation just happened to give resistance to it. It increased very rapidly in frequency in 20 years until virtually every bloatfly had it. And simultaneously, it was incorporated into the phenotype or the structure uh, much more efficiently. So other genes had been selected for that counteracted its negative effects so that the organism could enjoy just its negative effects. Um, I don't want to give more examples. They're endless. And it is a lie, if I may use the language of this character, to apply otherwise. Now, um, oh Lord. All right. There's a, there's a dreadful confusion. There's a dreadful confusion throughout this presentation between types of organisms, species of organisms, varieties within species, and so on. Darwin's finch as well. He thinks they all came from a common ancestor, but they're all a bird. Yeah, but they're all different species. They don't interbreed with each other. And the bird that they came from is sometime in the more distant past. Um, now, he says, you know, the dog's still a dog. Well, that's a great point. He says broccoli, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts are still a plant. He says you can't graft a tree onto a hippopotamus. I mean, what is that teaching us exactly? The fact of the matter is that evolutionary logic assumes that natural selection has a period of time to work before species are formed. And if in the short period of time that we have selectively bred plants, we can produce broccoli, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts, which are all in the same species, not just a plant, they're members of the same species, they interbreed, it is natural to wonder if 500 years, or 5,000 years, or 50,000 years of the same selection couldn't produce organisms way beyond interbreeding with each other, which is the origin of new species. Have we actually done this in real time? Yes, we have, it turns out. Busy beavers in their laboratory have bred fly species that no longer can interbreed with the original species from which they came, and which are, by definition, new species. They had to breed very specifically for traits that cause isolation from species. So this is just sort of ridicule and verbal amusement, but has no contact with reality. Two minutes? Okay, I'll just make two more points. He tells us that unless you can see evolution taking place, in other words, unless you can go back in a time capsule and actually sit there and watch it happen, and then fast forward a few hundred years, and then a few hundred more, and then see it, if you can't do that, then the whole thing is bad to you left time. That is not true. And if it were true, then um, an atomic bomb dropping on your head would be an example of a fairy tale that happened to turn out to be true. Atomic phenomena are not visualized and seen to the degree that he wants you to see scientific phenomena, but they're certainly a part of science. You cannot see a star being born because it takes, by any reasonable calculation, uh, tens and hundreds of millions of years to take this take place, and you don't live that long. Now, he tells me 
at the outset, oh, well, he's going to give me uh, these other kinds of evolution. Uh, he'll just concentrate on a biological evolution as I wanted. But he hadn't given me nothing because he still wants to start the Earth 4,000, uh, 5,000 years ago. So he hadn't given me nothing. Those other disciplines say that the, the planet has existed about uh, the, the, the universe 15,000 years, the planet five, uh, 15 million. The planet five billion, so nothing happened until four thousand years ago, and then uh, and then uh, living creatures uh, appeared all at once. Most implausible. Um, the gill slit stuff is is uh, a little sideshow that I can get into later if you want. Uh, the immune system contribution in the appendix is grossly overrated. As for the notion that the whale, uh, that you are looking at a vestigial pelvis there, that's not a fantasy uh, completely. We have a fossil record, oh, he tells us it's not a record, just a bunch of bones. We have bones of creatures, and they go downward in time, deeper and uh, earlier sediments, also timed by timing mechanisms that are consistent, that show whale-like creatures with bigger pelvises, whale-like creatures with pelvises and limb bones, whale-like creatures, although less whale-like, with the actual bones sticking out in the flippers. And we even have lineages that strongly suggest which group they came from, which I think were cattle-like uh, creatures, small cattle-like creatures. That's my response to what I've heard so far. Nothing whatsoever, it said. No paleontologist writing in English, French, German, or 
Berger denies this is so. It's simply a fact. Darwin's theory and the fossil record are in conflict. According to Stephen Gould at Harvard, he said, as Darwin noted in Origin of Species, an abrupt emergence of arthropods in the fossil record during the period represents presenting problems for evolutionary biology. There are no obvious simple or immediate forms, either living or in the fossil record. We go all day, there are no transitions between any different kinds of animals. There's no transitions before the fish came from. The transition from spinous invertebrates to the first backbone fish is still shrouded in history. Where did all the birds come from? The two origin of birds is still up in the air. Belushi is one of the world's experts on birds. How about the whales? Evolutionary origin of whales remains controversial among zoologists. Uh, what about flowering plants? We can talk about all the different fossil ones. There are fossil records. Even if there were a date stamp on them, even if they were billions of years old, still wouldn't prove any relationship. If I get buried right on top of a hamster, that doesn't prove he's my grandpa. So even if they are in order, which they're not, but he thinks they are, okay, even if they were in some kind of order, that still wouldn't prove that would prove their relationship. Luther Sutherland asked major evolutions all over the world, where is the evidence for evolution? Yes, Owen Patterson has got access to the largest fossil collection on planet Earth, the British Museum of Natural History. He said, Dr. Patterson, I read your book about evolution. I know that you didn't show any missing links. Why not? Where are the missing links? Here is Patterson's response. I fully agree with your comments on the lack of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. I would lay down the line there is not one such fossil. There are no missing links, folks. What change is missing? The Google said the absence of fossil evidence is an agony problem for evolution. Boy, if there is, we've got a great theory, only it has evidence. That's why I read uh, uh, Richard Goldsmith 50 years ago, 60 years ago, to say, the first bird hatched a reptilian egg. We don't find missing links, so it must happen quickly. <laughs> That's ludicrous. They tell these kids to think critically. The fossil record shows that organisms evolved in any small changes over time. That's a lie, by the way. Which theory best describes an organism's evolution? Gradualism or punctuated equilibrium? Explain. This is not learning to think critically. They're giving the kid two options. Which is it? Did evolution happen slowly or did evolution happen quickly? They do this in textbooks all over the place. According to the theory of gradualism, new species evolve slowly. According to punctuated equilibrium, new species evolve rapidly. Did it happen really slowly like Darwin or quickly like Gould? They don't seem to be capable of thinking outside the box. It didn't happen. They give the kids two options. Did evolution happen slow or quick? Which one, kid? How about the uh, of the above? This is not education. This is indoctrination. This is Soviet style. I debated Dr. Pete Bellucci from O.P. Knoxville. I said, Dr. Pete Bellucci, you studied the evolution of plants for 10 years. You got $650,000 in grant money. You studied the evolution of plants. What's your best evidence for evolution? He said, evolution of whales. <laughs> Think about it. 
If you find a bone that looks kind of like a fox and it's got a whale and ear bone that looks kind of like a whale's ear bone, is that proof that the fox evolved for the whale? Anybody with half a brain and a little bit of common sense could say, no, that's not true. He might choose to believe that, which would be part of his religion. That's fine. He can have another religion. But he should make all of it pay for it. Don't uh, too long to see. Let's see. He mentioned the beneficial mutations as bacteria becoming resistant to antibiotics. You can ask anybody that studied this out thoroughly. When the bacteria become resistant to antibiotics, it's because there was a loss of information in the bacteria, not a gain. The bacteria lost information. I don't interrupt you when you speak. I don't interrupt you when you speak, okay? The bacteria lose information. It's like if you're handcuffing people and somebody doesn't have any arms, so you can't handcuff them. Well, that might be a benefit at that moment, but you can't handcuff them. There's still a loss of information. The bacteria can't lock on to the uh, mechanism because they've lost information. There's some funny stuff on this on the uh, Answers Genesis website. Well, they are about bacteria. It doesn't evolve. It loses information. When they dug up the guys that froze that were trying to find the Northwest Passage, they found out that some of them were already resistant to, already had a resistance to penicillin. Penicillin hadn't been developed yet. How do these guys already have this, this resistance to penicillin in their system? That's just evidence. It, it, it's not really an increasing information. It's a loss of information. He mentioned the Australian blowfly. A uh, mutant blowfly would have some kind of benefit because of uh, something changed in the environment. It's still a fly. Is that process, my question would be to Dr. Rivers, is the process you described of bacteria becoming resistant to drugs or a low fly with a mutant mutation being able to survive in its environment, is that process sufficient in your mind to change from a rock to a human or from an egg to a human or from a pizza to a human or whatever process you want to use? The fact of the matter is there's eight or six, eight or nine thousand kinds of creatures on this planet, basic kinds of animals. And to think that they all had a common ancestor, he talks about genetic, you know, uh, inbreeding when people know it's daughters and sons marrying each other. Talk about inbreeding, he thinks everything came from a rock. What is the genetic variety in a rock 4.6 billion years ago? Man, talk about inbreeding. Okay, go take our first time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's 
why do they tell time that matches exactly uh, the time that geologists give and that we match the paleoclimatical time as well? But let's turn to the races. I'm just curious how you fall out on this view. Um, how did they get generated? We're starting with Noah and his wife and his children. How so quickly, and absent any beneficial mutations, and with this appalling record of inbreeding that wipes out variability, how did you get this wonderful variability in our species, including the Chinese, the Africans, the Asians, the Africans, the Europeans? So, how did you get it? No beneficial mutations? Uh, it's a, okay. First, uh, first I, I guess I object to the term race. I think there's one race. It's called the human race. Oh. <laughs> I think it's quite obvious to anybody who's been around. All of the so-called races are certainly interfertile and agreed with each other. Um, so there is not really the concept of race is uh, very much overblown. There are just skin colors, okay? Wow. Uh, these are not different races of cows here because they are, you know, different skin colors, okay? They all look the same in the meat locker and they all taste the same on a hamburger. Oh. So, with that said, there are four basic theories of uh, where the races came from. I actually believe probably the Bible illustrates the best, uh, gives the best uh, option. At the Tower of Babel, within the first few hundred years after the flood, the Bible says God confounded them by their languages, by their nations, and by their families. In that case, you get people breaking up into small groups or maybe a few hundred, and they all speak, you know, French or German or Italian or whatever. And then there would be probably quite a few things that would cause different racial traits to become pronounced. And sometimes it's a mutation, like for instance, uh, an extra how uh, uh, to fast in the eyelid that causes oriental people to have more slanted eyes. It's, 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 it's no different than anybody else other than it's something they have. The Norwegians, for instance, have typically blonde hair. The Aborigines have very small calf muscles. The Indians have high cheekbones. There are quite a few varieties that we call racial traits that actually are so minor compared to the idea we all came from a rock. You know, I just kind of. Welcome back to the rock. I gather you don't prove uh, the recent case and think so much as just say you read the Bible and so it's kind of a missing story to you. But let me ask you this. Has creation science ever predicted a thing? science would predict all sorts of things. We would predict, based on the biblical record, that if you dig in the ground, you find an awful lot of fossils because there was a flood that destroyed everything. Well, we did that already. I mean, a prediction. Well, it's true. I mean, the Bible says there was a flood, and we dig in the ground, we find bones. I mean, that's, that's a prediction. That's a fact. We find all over the world uh, petrified trees in a vertical position connecting different layers of rock. Now, if you would like to believe those layers are different ages, which you've said several times tonight, you'll have to believe that, but the scientific evidence is against that. I would predict we would find that if you crossbreed any kind of animal, you get the same kind, like the Bible says. Farmers plant corn, they expect to eat corn. So the biological prediction that animals have, have varieties, but they're limited. I would predict that uh, any breeder of anything, whether it be cows or corn, will find that there are limits. Number one, you can't go beyond a certain limit. And the further you get from the norm, the more problems you begin to have. Like with the Great Dane or the Chihuahua, you know, they get hit this late and they get problems. I would predict there would be biological limits to the changes based on the Bible record. Okay, uh, my turn. Uh, I, again, I would like to point out, I guess, for the record, Your Honor, that uh, if the creationists were asking their theory to be tax supported, then the burden of proof would be on them. But we're not. You are asking for the tax dollars to support your religion, so the burden of proof is on you, okay? So it's not on me. Now, you mentioned tonight. You mentioned tonight that there are over 80 billion fossils that have been discovered, many of them cataloged in museums. I agree. I don't know where you get the number 80 billion, but I wouldn't question anything. I think there are all a lot of fossils that have been discovered. I have a huge number in my museum. I would like to know from you, Dr. Rivers, which one do you think best represents a missing link 
that is an indication of one animal changing to a different kind of animal. There are 80 billion of them been found, billions put in museums. Which one is your best evidence for evolution? Please. Well, um, my good doctor, um, I won't give you one or two or three, but I, I, uh, the best is kind of a, a foolish question in my mind. There, you cannot from a single so-called missing link produce a evidence for a general pattern that's very strong. But you have denied there are any kinds of missing links, and that, I think, is a rather extreme position to take. The coelacanth, for example, has been regarded as a living uh, fossil because its anatomy, as you know, matches closely the anatomy of the group of fishes, the little fin fishes, which paleontology and geology taught us emerged from the water, I don't know what it was, 300 million years ago or what. That's a missing link between huge groups, that whole group of vertebrates that are fish, and that whole group of vertebrates that live on land. Okay, is that, if you only want one. Well, that's what I want is your best one. And coelacanth is the first one that comes to your mind. Uh, I'm sure you're aware, of course, that they're not missing, they're still alive. Uh, they're not missing. I agree. Yeah. So how can that be evidence of something that's intermediary if they're still alive? Uh, how is that? And are you, I'm sure, aware of the fact that the seal camp has been studied very carefully since Latimer found the first one in 1938, and they do not use those limbs for anything other than swimming like a normal fish. So it's still a fish, it's still obviously a fish. Why would you say seal camp is transitioning to something else? In 325 million years since the Devonian period, why have seal camps remained seal camps? Well, I, I, well, not all seal camps have. What I said was, the living coelacanth is related to the coelacanths 300 million years ago, that's what it was, plus or minus however many. For that, the fossil record suggests crawled out of the, some branch of which I should say, crawled out of the ocean and used those little fins to walk on, etc. Okay. Textbooks do teach that 325 million years ago, the coelacanth uh, was it's actually one of the index fossils for the Devonian period in a typical textbook. Uh, they assume that these low, these short arms before the fins were used for crawling on land. This is typical propaganda in a textbook. This is also a lie. The low fin fish are still alive. They've been proven uh, uh, that they're, they don't change anything else. So if you want to imagine that the coelacanth changed to something else, you said, I said, there's still coelacanth, and you said, it's not all of them. Now you've gone, you, I don't think you realize, if you just left science and went to your religion, you believe that long ago and far away, some of them must have diversified, because after all, they're different. But what evidence do you have? There would have to be something between the coelacanth and whatever they turned into. If the coelacanth is the best example of your um, missing link, it's not missing, and it's not an example. Right, so, thank you. so you said you have two or three. What's your next one? Well, I, I don't like you uh, forcing into a single missing link. Let's just say human evolution. Human evolution. And there you've got the links that run right backwards through Homo sapiens, uh, through Homo erectus, through Australopithecus africanus, to whatever they call the next one, to forms that diverged by 70 million years ago, close on to chimpanzees. So that's a series of links that support the notion, they don't prove it, they support the notion and provide increasingly detailed support for the notion that our own shape changed over time as you run backwards, dated and organized by paleontological record, um, and converge on a, a neat life form. Okay, you mentioned the uh Human evolution to the caveman series. I'm sure you're aware of the fact that nearly all of these have been proven wrong over the years. Like the 1912 New York Times and Article Darwin series proved true uh, because the Piltdown Man, which was later proven to be a fraud, or the Rask Man, which proved to be a page two, or Neanderthal Man, which is perfectly normal human, but still it's in textbooks. His brain is bigger than ours, 13% bigger. Um, 
And it's just a matter of first and full days to probably act on Bailey's and documented thoroughly by Jack Palazzo, the dentist here in New Jersey, by the way, uh, who has uh, documented thoroughly that Neanderthals are perfectly normal humans to form disease in great age. So, which specific caveman, I guess, or uh, hominid, would you say is has been has not been proven wrong? I think I have data on nearly all of them uh, to, to show that they've all been discredited as either fully human, fully ape, or misidentifiable, unidentifiable. Uh, I'm afraid I've got to uh, call on your veracity and question on this. Yes, Hilton was a famous host. Yes, one or two other uh, alleged fossils haven't uh, turned out, but Neanderthals, if it was true, that an early theory regarding them was that they were, uh, uh, had some dietary deficiency or deformed or whatnot, but there's a very detailed record of Neanderthals. There are hundreds of Neanderthal specimens. Furthermore, whether they were human in our sense or not, I used to interbreed with us, is not quite clear. I would assume they could. Whether they left any genes in our current population, I don't know. I do know that mitochondrial DNA that was extracted from a Neanderthal uh, measured uh, from geological time, it could be about a half a million years old, um, showed um, that their mitochondria was just at the outer edge of the complete range of human variability, present human variability in that regard. Now, Neanderthals are a trivial portion of the fossil record of hominids going backwards. Homo erectus, as it's called, is spread all through Asia, found in Africa, spread through Europe, and that goes back to a million years, and there are, again, hundreds of fossils. Okay. You are talking gross dishonesty when you act as if every single fossil has been discredited as a host or as a dietary conformity. That is a The Neanderthals, about 300 have been found. Their brain is bigger than ours. Their average height is roughly, roughly the same as today, 5'9 for the males, 5'3 for the females. Uh, the same skull was given to nine artists. Here's the pictures. And they said, what did it look like? They got nine different pictures. What would you like it to look like? And as anybody knows, an artist can make things, you know, look more ape-like or more human-like. Uh, Jack Palazzo, uh, orthodontist for 32 years, studied the growth bones of the human face and said the bones of your brow ridge never stop growing, as do most bones in your face grow continually. If a person lived past 100 or 200, their bones would be huge over their eyebrow. The Bible teaches right after the flood, people lived to be 400 for a few generations. My contention would be the Neanderthals were simply post-flood people that were living to great age. They're perfectly normal human, and they're uh, recognizable as human. He mentioned uh, Homo erectus. This one has been proven wrong for quite some time ago. I'm surprised you would mention that. Just uh, bring it up here. Wait some time for questions, please. Those of you in the audience here have got something to say, then do it in order, please. Uh, okay. Um, Homo erectus. Here we go. Used to be called Java Man. Later called Hippocampus erectus. Uh, the date of evolution is at a half million years old, like you said. It was made from a few, the first one, it was made from a few scraps of bone, found in 1891 by a Dutch anatomist named Dr. DeVault. He had gone to evolution to look for missing links. He's not an unbiased observer. He hired a bunch of convicts out of the prison to go find bones. They were rewarded if they found bones and brought it back to him. What he found was an eight skull cap, three human teeth, and a thigh bone, which was obviously human, a year and found 50 feet away a year later. He put them together and said he found a missing link. He hit the back and he found two human skulls in the same area, normal humans. He hit them under his bed, under the uh, floorboard of his, of his uh, cottage there. So, uh, the end, I mean, the uh, Homo erectus, I think you need to read the book, uh, this book, Bones of Contention, and I'll send you one if you'll read it, uh, about the so called caveman by Norman Lubin. I spent 25 years studying all of these, so I think you're mistaken if you think there's evidence.
mentioned back to the earlier comment of this, he says, when I said if the self replicating molecule occurred, then this would happen. Right away, I left sign when I put it in front of the sentence. Now, that's ludicrous if you know anything about science or logic. It's filled with statements. If this were true or is true, then this would follow. And we pursue those logical trains to try to uh, get a deeper view of reality. Furthermore, he takes the longest DNA molecule and has it uh, create itself with all the traditional evolved complexity out of nothing. What you're imagining is a little snippet of RNA that starts self-replicating. Now, regarding his chimpanzee foolishness, all of that is nonsense, and trust me on that. Uh, I've spent 15 years trying to master uh, genetics and evolutionary genetics, and I, I think I know a little bit about it. It is nonsense to say 48,000 nucleotides are missing from chimpanzee to humans. They have not difference in nucleotide number, but a difference in what they are. That's the 1.6% we're talking about. We're not saying that chimps are missing it or were missing. Furthermore, he says if you have three nucleotides missing, that is fatal. That is nonsense. That is only true within genes, and that is only true within some locations within genes. And if you look at our total genome, which is 3 billion nucleotides, only about 1 to 5 percent of those nucleotides actually consist of genes. All the others you can delete nucleotides up to hundreds and have the organism unaffected. That's well known today.
Uh, could there, can you, does evolution have the same problem that the creationists claim? The creationists would claim all the dogs in the world came from two dogs on Noah's Ark. The question I think is asking, if evolution happened, at some point, long ago and far away, you had a dog evolved. Don't you have the very same problem if there are 250 or 400 varieties of dogs today? They all had to come from that, that dog. So you still got the inbreeding problem, only now you put it long ago and far away. It's so, so different. Yes, you have the very same problem. I agree. Good question. Dr. Roman, um, question to you. What evidence is available to support creation? Well, I don't think you have to light a candle to see the sun. I think if you walk into the woods and you find a painting hanging on a tree, it's logical to conclude there was a painter, even if you don't ever see the painter. Uh, you don't find any footprints, you find no evidence. You find a painting, that's proof there was a painter. If you walk into the woods and you find a building, that's evidence there was a builder, even if you can't find the guy. If these paleontologists are digging through the dirt around here and they find an arrowhead, they automatically conclude it was man-made. They would never dream that an arrowhead fashioned out of plant was a naturally occurring object. Naturally occurring objects are easily distinguishable from man-made artifacts, and it's distinguishable by most five-year-olds. I think if you find a creation, you'll say there must have been a creator. Now, who was the creator? Is it Allah or Buddha or Jehovah? That's a whole different set of arguments, but the fact is, there must have been a designer. I think the design itself, the, the design of the universe at every level, micro to macro, proves there was a designer. I was in Japan, I did not see the guy who makes the Casio data bank watch, but I think it's logical for me to sit here in New Jersey and say there must have been a designer for this watch. These things don't happen by themselves. And this watch is child's play compared to one cell in the human body. One cell in the human body is more complex than a space shuttle. It's the most complex thing ever built by man. And if anybody wants to think that happened by chance, they're welcome to believe that, but that is a wildly silly religion. It's not science. That's design is evidence of a designer.
first of all, I would say that the, the differences between humans and apes are enormous, okay? The similarities are because we have similar duties to perform in life. Uh, we have to walk, move around, find our food, etc. I think any similarities between organisms of any kind could easily be, could easily be characterized as evidence of a common designer. Uh, as I mentioned, Toyotas and Hondas have many similarities. So what? That proves to have is, is, is a design that works. You know, four wheels uh, on the ground and a steering wheel and some mechanism, something to sit on. That's all the design is necessary to work. So I think if we look at similarities between humans and chimps and conclude there's a common designer, that's just as logical as including there's a common ancestor. I think even more logical than including there must have been a designer. I would point out that uh, there are 26 basic letters of the alphabet. We can go around the corner to the library here and find just probably every one of those books in there is built on that same code, 26 letters. If the dictionary has the same 26 letters as the Encyclopedia Volume S does, that doesn't prove one evolved from the other or they both came from a smoke in a print shop. That proves that's the code with which you write English. So there are 20 amino acids. All animals have these 20 amino acids in the protein. That doesn't prove any relationship. That's the code with which you make proteins. And it has to be that way, so the brown cow can eat the green grass, give the white milk, and make the yellow butter, and I eat it, get the blonde hair. This, if it weren't for all similar proteins and similar amino acids, we could only digest and eat each other. And God made it so that animal, you know, you can eat a variety of things. So the similarities proves a common designer who is really thinking ahead. I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, one last 
We have one last uh, question. I find that I try to give direct answers to questions. And we get a whole essay on other topics and so on, and a whole set of new represent uh, misrepresentations, including these fossil trees, uh, which were, were explained 150 years ago and are well known. Uh, we have one question. Um, we also hope um, the echo of the long question that you um, just had. And then we have one other set of questions. I got all my
with page after page after page after page of fossils that get more and more looking like uh, humans, but then finally they're there. And then you'll say, oh, well, that doesn't show anything. Maybe it shows something about humans. Probably doesn't. You want to see it for all these other groups. It's, it's just not a, uh, I guess it's not believed to be an effective way to teach. And it's certainly not felt to be as necessary as uh, Dr. Hoban would lead you to believe, since he repeatedly misrepresents the actual evidence that does exist. Okay, a couple of things. Uh, first, I would say uh, I have heard numerous times tonight Dr. Kerber say that I misrepresent the facts, and I want to go on record as saying I resent that. I think I tried very hard to represent the facts clearly and carefully. Secondly, he said several times I did not answer certain questions. Uh, how many of you felt that I did answer the question that was asked in those cases? Okay. And thirdly, I will stick by my gun that there is no such thing as a fossil record. There are simply billions of fossils in the ground. Now, if you want to put your interpretation on them, that's fine. That's what everybody does. But the fact is we find bones in the dirt. End of story. Uh, all you know is it died. And if you think there's a missing link, so I would like to ask Dr. Trevor, and I know it's my response to him. He got to go first, but I'll give him another chance to talk. Do you disagree, then, when Colin Patterson says, who has the largest fossil collection in the world, when he says, I agree with your comments on the lack of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil. Is he lying? Is he wrong? Do you know something he doesn't know? He didn't want to respond. Why is there a I would want to respond to that either question. Okay. The last question is don't we have trans uh transitory fossils, a hominid such as Lucy, proving evolution? Donald Johansson found Lucy two weeks before his grant money ran out. He had gone there on a grant to find some missing links. He was desperate to find something in the last two weeks. Lucy was three feet tall. Charles Oxner studied every single bone of Lucy, did what's called a computer multivariate analysis, comparing the length to width, the width, depth to the ratios, all these things. He said, after 16 years of studying the bones of Lucy, Lucy is an unusual chimpanzee type creature. It is definitely not a missing link. It was three feet tall. There are some creatures in Sumatra down near Vietnam that are very, very similar skeletal structures to Lucy and maybe the same thing. Again, Lucy was a bone found in the dirt. You don't know that Lucy had any kids. You sure don't know if she had different kids. And you don't know any much more about it than 40% of the skeleton was found. The three feet tall, people who looked at it said it was a chimpanzee or some kind of type of ape-like creature. And that is not evidence of evolution. That's an evidence of hyperactive imagination. It should have been on uh, probably some kind of drug popping down. <laughs> Thank you. 
designed Mr. Dottie Evolution himself. It is not true. Now, where he holds out this bizarre quote that after looking at 80 million fossils or whatever he had in his collection, he still couldn't find a missing link, I don't know. And I don't know what the man meant by it. There is ultimately, you know, the notion that there's a single missing link is a kind of hopeless venture. Uh, especially when antagonistically used, there are a whole series of links that gradually increase your confidence that you can establish connections between these sets of non-reproducing bones that these two things are. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this video series on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. Much more important, though, than knowing all the truth and facts about science is to know the truth about whether you're going to heaven or not. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, uh, let me explain quickly what you need to do to go to heaven. The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all broken God's laws. We've disobeyed the Creator. We've, we've done wicked things. We're sinners. Some are worse than others, at least in man's eyes, but we've all broken God's laws. And the Bible says you have to repent. The word repent means to turn. It actually means two things, to turn from your sin and to turn to God. God's looking for a change in your attitude where you say, Lord, I don't want to do wrong anymore. I'm sorry, I've offended you. I want to do right. And you turn from sin and you turn to God and say, God, would you please forgive me? Would you save me? The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need to admit you're a sinner. Number two, the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die and go to hell because of our sin. But Jesus died for you. He loves you. He wants you to come to heaven. And anybody that will ask him for the free salvation, God will give you the gift of eternal life, it says in Romans 6, 23. It's a free gift. And it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you would just call and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Would you please forgive me? And ask him. He will give you that free gift of eternal life. Why don't you just pray with me right now and you could receive Christ as your Savior. There's no magic words. God's looking at your heart. But if you could say this and mean it, God would forgive you. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please apply your blood to my account. Forgive my sins and take me to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says if you call upon the Lord, you shall be saved. So if you've asked the Lord to save you, He promised He'd save you. Now your job is to grow. Read your Bible, pray, get involved in a good Bible-believing church, and begin to grow to be a good Christian. Thank you so much. Call or write if we can be any help at all. We'd be glad to help.